A while back I did a video essay entitled, The Black Media, Accept No Substitute. That video essay was ahead of its time, but I hope that with recent events, it's a lot more clear why I put that out there. I knew that the white media at some point was going to try to do a half measure in between ignoring us when that no longer was an option and in between taking us on directly, which would mean actually raising our profile by attacking us directly, which they don't want to do because they don't have an answer for us. Taking us on directly would be a big mistake in a lot of ways for them. In the long run, in the end, it would be. In the middle, you would have trying to find a way to hijack the black media's message and our goals and our movement. That would be what they would go for at some point. And in order to do that, it was obvious what they were going to try to do. They were going to try to use a bunch of Negroes on the payroll because they've been doing that for over 100 years. This has actually been white supremacy's standard operating procedure since the plantations. It's just going to be a big con what's coming, but I need you to be on full alert for it. We need to call this crap out when we see it. Remember the days when some two-bit shyster tried to scam a few extra bucks by finding some popular consumer item and then coming up with their own cheap knockoff? They'd get some sweatshop in China or Russia or the Philippines or some other corner of the Far East and they'd have some $2 an hour wage slave making some imitation Gucci bag or some feckless Nike shoes. The knockoffs were very easy to spot because they were so poorly made. Well, white supremacy is mounting their own effort to manufacture an imitation black media. But instead of using cheap materials and sub-rate workers, they're using the white media's own big budget resources to do it. We're talking about top production values here. A huge PR budget. The white media spends millions to make, market, and promote crap like the 1619 Project. Typically, when white power is trying to hoodwink black people, they find some pliable, willing stooge that they can use. Some Negro who is black-skinned, but that's where the similarities between us and them end. They find some D. Ray McKeeson or a Barack Obama or a Kamala Harris, put them on TV, give them a ton of complimentary news coverage to build them up in the eyes of the public, and tell you that this unknown Negro who might as well have come down from Mars, well, you should listen to him because they're a somebody. Why? Well, because they're on TV and the white media is not attacking them. In fact, the white media talks about their education and the organizations that they've been part of. Why the white media talks about them as if they were, well, as if they were as credible as the white experts that they usually have on. Except this black person is never actually an expert on anything. They're just there to be the official voice for black people. So that when white power brings about some injurious horrible, deleterious policy upon us, they can point to their own hand-picked Negro and say, well, there were black people who wanted it. Like who? Well, there was our puppet Barack Obama, and then our other puppet Kamala Harris, and then our other puppet Cory Booker, and then our other puppets, the Congressional Black Caucus, and there were some pork chop preachers who also were in favor of it that way, as Bill Clinton did when he was forced to have to answer for the 94 crime bill. They can say, well, yeah, those black preachers over there and maybe do it. I didn't want it, but those, those black preachers, those black preachers, you, you can blame them. That's the game that they've been playing for the longest time. Now, why has this con in particular been so effective? White supremacy wouldn't have been doing it for over 100 years if it wasn't working. So why does it work? It works because, as Dr. John Henry Clark observed, black people have this habit of thinking that somebody's going to do something for them. Fighting white supremacy seems to be something that black folks have better things to do than to fight white supremacy. So we instead look for some black front person, some black person who we can put out front and we'll go ahead and cheer them on while they fight white supremacy. We're looking for some horse who we can hitch our hopes and dreams to. We can hitch the wagon of liberation up to some Malcolm X or up to some Huey Newton or up to some Dr. King or who have you or up to some Marcus Garvey and well, they're going to pull us to liberation. Apparently that's the idea. And that's the problem. White supremacy saw this and was going, well, these guys are so weak-willed and weak-minded that they're looking for some champion for their race. Well, that's what we'll do. We'll go ahead and present them with a champion. Why? We can do a better job of presenting a black champion to them because we got more money to use to do it. 
And that's exactly what they've been doing because we have been looking for some one great Negro who was going to slay white supremacy. We've been looking for a Moses when what we should have been looking for are our own Ten Commandments, not a leader, but a leading ideology. Racism is a group sport, but so is black empowerment. But that's a reality that black folks refuse to accept. You don't find some leader or some charismatic spokesman who will take down white supremacy while all you do is sit on the sidelines cheering them on occasionally. But the white media and the white powers that be in general, they've learned that with our crushing Kamala Harris, that the old mentality of, well, we're going to find some Negro who's going to be our front man, some champion that we're going to cheer on to take on white supremacy. They see now that black people have matured beyond that. And the reason why is they've seen that there's a handful of black voices out here who are wise to the white media's tricks. And these new voices of black media are educating our people about how white supremacy has manipulated us for so long so that we don't fall into the same old traps. And we're talking to young black people so that we create a generational problem for white supremacy. You ain't going to just be fighting Professor Black Truth. I'm trying to reach the minds of the children of the babies. So you're going to be fighting Professor Black Truth 50 years from now. That's what I'm attempting to set in motion. That's what the new voices of black media are attempting to set in motion. Dr. John Henry Clark was fighting against white supremacy in the 1980s. And especially when it comes to brothers like myself and TBA and Tariq Nasheed and Tari and Rain and others, you are effectively fighting the sons of Dr. John Henry Clark. You're facing the sons of Dr. Joseph Benyakinen. You thought these guys went away. You thought Dr. Clark went away in the 90s and you're still having to fight him today and you will still have to fight his acolytes and his disciples a half century from now. That's what we're attempting to put in place. And white power can see this. They know exactly how you create a generational problem that can't be solved. They know exactly how it's done. They've been doing it to us for the longest time. And now that we're fighting back, they're attempting to head this one off early. White power is not going to trot out some hand-picked flunky anymore to deceive us because we don't have a leader. We have a leading ideology, but that's not to say the white supremacy doesn't also have a ploy for that. If our guiding star is an ideology, then the white media will attempt to mislead us through fraudulent ideas. There's an old saying that repetition is the mother of learning, but the Nazis had a saying too. Repeat a lie enough times and it will become the truth. This is where the white media comes in. You're not going to be able to push any sort of lies on masses of people without a strong propaganda arm to put the muscle into the message. They see what we're doing and they have witnessed the impact that we've had. And now they're trying to saturation bomb the black community with all manner of anti-black counter programming. They feel like they need an answer to the new voices of black media. So obviously putting a black misleader out there isn't going to work. So they're going to need to try to cultivate and raise up and promote their own bumper crop of black flunky voices out there who they're supposed to be the antithesis to us. They're supposed to be our opposite, like some sort of degenerate satanic mirror universe. They're going to try to come up with their own version of us, an evil version of the new voices of black media. That's what the white media is attempting to put in place right now. A counter message that's meant to negate what we're saying. A counter message that's meant to cancel out black empowerment. And they do this by trying to make these political distractions into some sort of media event. Make it huge. Make it prominent. Make it just so monumental that everybody hears about it. You can't miss it. And hopefully you won't be able to look away either. Same as when you're watching a car wreck. If the black media talks about reparations, then the white media will put on a media circus. They'll bring out the clowns, some safe Negroes, and put them on Capitol Hill, put them in front of Congress so that you have this wonderful official-looking backdrop for their little con show. 
and they'll be pretending as if reparations is important to them, but like a stage-managed production on Broadway, they'll have a panel full of Negroes whose entire purpose is to redefine reparations. And by the time they're done, they hope that they have taught people, that they have indoctrinated people with the idea that, well, reparations can be anything except a check. Don't listen to those new voices of black media. Why? They, they've got very narrow ideas when it comes to reparations. We got to think big when it comes to reparations. Oh, you mean think about a big check, a $20 trillion check? You mean think big like that, right? No, I mean, um, think big as far as what reparations could be. Why? Uh, reparations could be um, an educational program. Well, how about this? You put $20 trillion in my pocket. I'll make my own educational program. I'll build my own schools. I'll pay my own teachers. And I'll also be able to fund my own curriculum. Well, uh, that's not what we're thinking about. Well, what are you thinking about then? Well, what we're thinking about is we're going to make sure that preschoolers are taught about LGBT, you know, LGBT activities. That That's what we're thinking about. Think big. Think very big. That's the kind of verbal con game and weasel words that they try to use. They don't talk about how black people are going to get compensated for the greatest crime in human history how we're going to balance the completely lopsided black-white wealth gap in America. We don't talk about that. Instead, what we're going to talk about is everything except tangibles. Anything other than something that black people own, that black people control, and that black people can pass down to their children. They'll be talking about the environment. They'll be talking about the LGBT movement. They'll be talking about feminism. They'll be talking about the man on the moon. They'll be talking about the price of rice in China. They'll be talking about everything except our tangibles. That's going to be the new reparations conversation. Julianne Malveaux, when she was taking part in that fraud on Capitol Hill a few months back, she suggested that the Democratic Party's political programs could count as reparations. Now, she never said anything specifically for those of us who came out of the plantation. She didn't say anything specific. It's not specific for us. It's just a matter of, well, any government program that black people are able to have access to counts as reparations. Ain't that exactly what the Republicans say? Well, welfare and food stamps, ain't that reparations? And the NBA, ain't that reparations? Ta-Nehisi Coates, he was willing to settle for less than that. And this was what, what was supposed to pass for a pro-reparations advocacy group. This is what a pro-reparations panel apparently is in the bizarro world of the white media. And of course, on the other side, you had the ridiculous chumps whose only purpose was to be foils so that everybody could look at them and go, boo, you guys are full of crap. Of course, they were full of crap. But the thing about it is you're not going to be able to sell a lie like this without some controlled opposition. So that's what they were there for. That's what Coleman Hughes Cruz was there for. But when you look at what the alleged pro-reparations panel suggested, you saw that both sides were in total agreement. Both sides agreed that reparations cannot and must not be a check, and certainly cannot be anything exclusively for people whose ancestors were enslaved here in North America. Everybody seemed to be in total agreement about that. And the white media did not criticize that at all. Nobody thought to actually critique either side. Instead, they just let these lies get spouted, repeated it and rebroadcasted a number of times, said that, oh, this is the reparations discussion. There was a discussion on reparations. It was a rep. Of course, they weren't going to try to debunk or to devalue any of it. Otherwise, people might say, well, that conversation clearly was not legitimate. Let's listen to what the new voices of black media have to say. Instead, they were just saying nothing about it at all. They weren't going to endorse it, but they also were not going to question it. And so you had liars on one side and so-called pro-reparations advocates who were lying by omission on the other side. But this is standard operating procedure for white supremacy. As Neely Fuller said, white supremacy believes in controlling both sides of an argument. You have one side that boldly advocates for the status quo, which is what white supremacy currently has in place, and you have another group claiming to be the opposition, or at the very least they claim to be different. But in actuality, they're saying the exact same thing as the status quo, 
As Noam Chomsky put it, it's the most sophisticated form of propaganda when something claims to be opposition, when in reality it's actually support. And this was just one incident. That congressional fraud that took place a few months back, that was just one incident. White supremacy's got a million of them up their sleeves. They were attempting to hijack the reparations issue from us and to manufacture their own fraudulent reparations discussion, one where the new voices of black media would not be heard. They were trying to create a media bubble around the reparations discussion, and they were going to make sure that the new voices of black media were singled out to be excluded from it. White power was going to use its media in order to establish some boundaries for what constitutes reparations. Well, we're going to we're going to make it where the reparations discussion has acceptable boundaries. There's going to be what's acceptable and then there's going to be what's not acceptable. And we're going to decide what constitutes acceptable reparations talk. If we're going to talk about reparations, we need some boundaries here. We're going to tell you what's in bounds and what's out of bounds. And they would use black flunkies like Ta-Nehisi Coates and Julianne Malvo and Jonathan Capehart in order to make it clear that giving black people the check that we earned, well, that's outside of white media's pre-prescribed boundaries of reparations. That's outside of what white media said were the reasonable boundaries of reparations. White power seems to think that the more we push for reparations, the less fringe the issue becomes. And as I demonstrated to you, as Pew Research themselves documented, almost 30% of Americans believe that we're owed reparations. That's the highest number in the country's history. And that was just last month when they came to that little conclusion. So what does that tell you? White media, under white power in general, they understand exactly what's happening. There has been a shift in the political tectonic plates, and that shift has been caused by you getting up and moving, you getting up and doing things. So they're trying to start the work now to establish that a check is unreasonable. And well, they're not going to get some white folks out there first to say it. First, you got to lay the groundwork. Whenever white power wants to tell some lie and push it, you got to get some front Negroes out there first, because otherwise everybody will identify it as the racist lie it is. So you got to get some black folks out there first to say the lie. This is something that the white right and the white left both do. Because they are both the right and left hands of white supremacy. So you get your black flunkies out there to say, on the one hand, black people shouldn't get a check. And on the other hand, well, uh, black people shouldn't get a check, but hopefully they'll get some government programs. As long as everybody else is able to get it too. And this is what reparations is. They're using their homegrown group of black flunkies to sell this lie. And this was not the only example. My YouTube channel came under attack a week and a half ago because I posted a video, which you can find on this channel. CNN's upcoming all black show is desperate and pointless. My video exposed the coming racial fraud of CNN's all black news show that's supposed to debut this fall. Well, my video was removed within hours of being posted. And YouTube tried to hide behind the total lie that, well, it's been removed as hate speech. Though predictably, they couldn't say what was so hateful about it. Their email to me claimed that it was removed after, quote unquote, their team reviewed the video. Now that's a bald faced lie. The B1 Brigade mobilized and they got on YouTube's butts. And the same YouTube who only hours before had censored the video, they were forced to restore it. They knew that they were lying. You knew that they were lying, but you guys made it clear. You could see them and you could call them out. They hadn't gotten away with anything. YouTube is an arm of the white media. They see themselves as digital gatekeepers, removing views that threaten white supremacy. See, because there's voices out here now loud enough to be heard outside of the white media's broadcast confines, outside of the outside of the media concentration camp of the TV studios. And so now that people are gravitating away from that, the white media is stuck now trying to figure out how do we stop these guys online? 
A couple of days ago, I posted an article from Adweek that said that more young people get their information from YouTube than get it from the standard news media. And when it comes to black youth, that means that they're listening to us. And by the way, if you haven't seen the video, CNN's upcoming all black show is desperate and pointless, then after you listen to this video essay, go and listen to it. I urge everyone to listen to that video to watch it because YouTube and it's safe to say the trash at the Caucasian Nazi network, they were so terrified at my having sounded the alarm to this coming fraud that they tried to censor the video immediately. Anything that terrifies white supremacy this much, that's must see viewing for you. I make it my hallmark to tell you what white supremacy is up to years before they actually do it. The same way I started warning you about Kamala Harris's presidential ambitions back in 2017. The deadly deception of Kamala Harris was one of my most watched videos on my prior channel. So when she announced her candidacy at the beginning of this year, it came as no surprise to the B1 Brigade and we were ready for her. White power saw what happened. The white media saw one of their puppets get knocked down, and they saw that it didn't happen at the hands of the white media. It wasn't even the Republicans who took out Kamala Harris. It was us. And that scared them to death. Because they never saw it coming and they had no answer for it. When we started lighting into her, they had no means to push back. We made the white media helpless. We made the white media impotent in the face of our demands for power. There's a lesson in that for black people, you know. We get attacked all the time by white supremacists and their black flunkies. And if we want to have these enemies of the black community punished, we don't have to run to some white liberal or hope that some kind-hearted white TV station or media outlet is going to take pity on us, we don't have to look to any corner of white supremacy to punish those who attack us. We already have the heft to be able to throw our weight around and take them down on our own. As H. Rap Brown said, our enemy doesn't have us outnumbered, they have us outorganized. Well, when we crushed Kamala Harris in a single day, we showed white power what happens when we are organized. Same way we did during the Ferguson and Baltimore uprisings, the white media was forced to retreat back to the cozy confines of their sound stages and TV studios because they saw black people, young black people, who were saying the same talking points that we say, the talking points that we gave to them, and they knew, uh-oh, we know where this came from. And we don't have an answer for this. We don't have to have the most numbers, but we do have to have the most influence. And that's going to come down to how strong our organization game is. Because most black folks are scattered to the four winds. Most black folks are into distractions and all sorts of dysfunction. And when it comes to black so-called organizations, most of these are professional do-nothing societies. So if we are organized and if we are aggressive about what we're doing by default, we carry the day because nobody else happens to be as organized as us. Nobody else is out there pushing this real stuff like we are. That's not to say that fighting white supremacy is an automatic or a given. It's simply meant to say that we already have a number of advantages beyond anything that white supremacy could put into the hands of some hand-picked flunkies simply because of the fact that we are organized. They're fighting for the minds of black people. And we have a big advantage in being able to get mind share and to gain mind share. Kamala Harris, she went to the same old usual suspects. I'm going to talk to the NAACP's winter luncheon. And then afterwards, I'll go to the Urban League spring luncheon. And then this summer, I'll go to the National Action Network summer luncheon. And I'm going to have some of my sorority sisters there and a couple other do-nothing fools who are desperately hoping that if I become president, they can have a spot in my administration. And they'll cheer me as I tell them, don't listen to those new voices of black media, especially don't listen to that professor of black truth. You know, he's, he's just a sexist. They tried that. Kamala Harris told herself that she was up against a self-appointed political pundit. 
She found out the hard way that what she was actually up against was a righteous army of black ideologues determined to have their power. She stood in our way. So we knocked her out of our way. And there was nothing white power could do to help her. White power failed to con us with phony operatives, so now they're resorting to phony ideas. And they're going to use their media to push these perverted distractions by propping up a phalanx of black flunkies to sell the soap. They're trying to make up their own white media-generated issues and ideas that will attempt to sound like they came from us or attempt to use our verbiage to try to sound like it's the kind of thing we would say. Hopefully it will sound similar enough to what the black media is saying that folks will be, that hopefully just enough of you will be fooled by it. Just enough of you will say, well, the New York Times is talking about 1619 and ain't it about, I, you said it's about the plantations. That's just like what we say. And then the New York Times will be like, yeah, but we ain't talking about no check. And we're not talking about punishing white supremacy. We're simply talking about back to the plantations. That's the same thing the Confederacy was talking about. By the way, I just think it needs to be noted, New York sided with the Confederacy during the Civil War. Who do you think those plantations were giving all that cotton to? They were taking it up to the Garment District in New York. So when you have the New York Times, which basically was one of the beneficiaries of slavery, getting out here telling you about 1619, they see 1619 the same way that David Duke sees it. It was the last time the white supremacy had the Negras under control. We talk about how ancestry and lineage matters and how it all goes back to the plantations of the Deep South. And the next thing you know, the New York slime comes along with their so-called 1619 project. They never gave a damn about 1619 before now. So why are they bringing it up all of a sudden? Because the new voices of black media are totally disrupting white supremacy at the grassroots. That's why. White media is desperately trying to get ahead of us. They realize just how far behind they were that we left them in the dust and now they're trying to play catch up. They're trying to figure out how do we get out in front of this black empowerment issue? How do we get out in front of this tangibles issue? But they're only trying it for the sake of leading black people away from tangibles and back towards apathy and disorder. Black people have begun walking the path of power. And while it's only a small number of us now, white media realizes that we have passed the tipping point. The black media has now attracted enough of the intelligent black people, the ones who are going to get things done, that now white power has to worry that a lot of other black people are going to gravitate into our orbit. As Jason Black aptly put it, I am not afraid of small numbers, so long as the numbers are powerful and brought enough resources to inflict their will. White supremacy knows when it's got some black folks who are actually trying to deal from a position of power, and they understand the absolute necessity of cutting that off before it even happens. Now, are a majority of black people going to get on code? Of course not, but we don't need a majority of them. Hell, we don't even want a majority of them. It's not a majority of any population who decides who eats and who doesn't eat. It is an influential and powerful minority who does. And white power doesn't want us cultivating that powerful minority within our own ranks. We're going to totally disincentivize any black collaboration with white supremacy by cutting any collaborators off. Same way we did with Kamala Harris. We made an example out of her, and white power was powerless to stop us. Do not underestimate the significance of white media trying to trot out their black flunkies. White power only tries to recruit black people to help them out whenever they're desperate. This was the case with the American Revolution, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, as well as World Wars I and II, and Vietnam. Well, that total desperation is on full display again by how eagerly white power is plucking Negroes from obscurity and giving them platforms, all for the sake of trying to push back against us. So, we have a 
effectively been able to hurt the white media, even though they've got billions of dollars at their disposal. We're talking about a billion dollar industry, and they are terrified of a comparative handful of black power seekers who don't even equal more than a million dollars tops, to be honest. But understand something, family. White power has not yet begun to fight us. They haven't even opened up on us with the big guns yet. Right now, they're trying to fight us obliquely. They're using their puppets to do it. When this tactic predictably fails, then they're going to bring out their white commentators, because that's what they're doing with these CNN panel and this 1619 nonsense. What they're doing is they're bringing out some black flunkies to spout the white supremacist line first. That way, when the white commentators, the ones who they really want to be out there attacking us, when those guys come along and do it, then they're going to say, well, we're not actually being racist. Why? Didn't you see what April Ryan was saying and Angela Rye with lettuce and tomatoes on the side and Bakari sellout? I mean, I'm um, sellers uh, and Andrew Gillum. And didn't you see what Roly Poly Martin was saying? We had him on Joy Reid's show this weekend. You saw what she was saying. And we're just we're just picking up on what they said. We're just following up on the conversation they started. That's how this always goes. You get some black Negroes out there first to spout the anti-black garbage. And then afterwards, now the white commentators have entree to take it to the next step. And they're not going to be tiptoeing around at all. They're going to come straight up the middle with the racism. That's what they're laying. That's what they're attempting to lay the groundwork for now. And that's the reason why I'm calling it out now. I want to make sure that we cut white supremacy off at the knees before they even stand up. I want to put a stop to this garbage before it even starts. Because these white commentators, when they come out the gate, they're going to begin banging the drum for policies to be enacted against the black media. And they're going to be preaching a non-stop sermon of how dangerous the new voices of black media are and how the new voices of black media are no different than the alt-right. That black media, these guys you see online, these self-appointed political pundits. Family, we're going to require a lot more resources for the war to come if we're going to defeat the full weight and might of the white media. We don't need to have as much as they do, but we're about to face an all-hands-on-deck situation. We will require a requisite amount of resources. This is why I'm getting rid of the bystanders and the wannabe observers now. This is why I'm getting rid of, driving them out now and telling them you ain't wanted here. This isn't a TV show. This is not politically oriented entertainment. This is life and death. This is going to determine whether or not our people stay on this earth. Whether or not the survivors of slavery in America continue to exist, or if white supremacy gets to finish the project that they started in 1865, which was to strangle us out of existence. We're about to face a full-on assault by the propaganda arm of white supremacy, and I intend for the black media to be ready for it. I'm not counting on white supremacy to trip over its shoelaces. I'm not counting on white supremacy not to show up to fight. I'm not counting on white supremacy not to show up to fight and to fight hard and to fight well. What I'm counting on is for us to show up more prepared, for us to be more eager, for us to be more driven and determined and motivated, for us to have better plans, for us to be able to cut these guys off to see their tactics and cut them off before they can use them. That's what I'm counting on for us to be ready. Because what we've seen so far this is just the beginning. You better be prepared to see some of these old fakers, frauds, phonies, and fools who you've seen on TV for decades. People who never mentioned us before. People who paid us no never mind. People who you would think that we were not even a blip on their radar. But I can tell you right now, in the coming months, you will all of a sudden begin seeing these same people who never mentioned us before. They're going to start saying our names. But it won't be to praise us. Bakari sellout called himself getting smart with the black authority, and Jason slapped him down hard. Howard Dean was cursing at Tariq Nasheed online, and absolutely no one on the left reprimanded him for that little display. And this is from a guy who used to be the head of the Democratic Party. So do not underestimate that. You and Howard Dean only narrowly failed to become head this time around. 
So you got the guys who run the Democratic Party, individuals who are desperately hoping to be movers and shakers at the higher echelons of the Democratic Party. They know who we are. Jonathan, putting on his cape heart, directly attacked the ADOS movement by name. He mentioned their name. And he called them a bunch of illiterates. And it was no less than Sheila Jackson Lee, the sponsor of the much ballyhooed HR40, who happily supported his slander by retweeting it. She didn't tell him, hey, that's a, these are reparation advocates. We can differ with them on tactics. We can have, we can have differences with them on, in terms of principle as far as immigration and such goes. But, but never mind, but you cannot attack them when these guys are the only people out there at the grassroots supporting reparations. I'm going to need these people. That's not what Sheila Jackson Lee said. Far as she was concerned, Jonathan putting on his cape heart, he was supposed to be her little attack dog. She was egging him on. So yes, across the board, the new voices of black media have attracted the attention of the black media bootlicks, the civil rights retreads, and the Negro opportunists who get every crumb of their daily bread from white supremacy. These are the people who stand to lose everything when black empowerment becomes a reality. So we're going to have a barrage coming down very soon of the white media trying to figure out how to reverse engineer their own counterfeit black media message. It's going to be wrapped up in our verbiage. They're going to take their lies and their distractions and their attempts to mislead us. They're going to wrap it up in our verbiage. They'll try to wrap it up in some of the issues that we have brought to the fore. They're going to try to wrap it up in some of the things that we've said, why they'll even try to drag out some of our grandmaster teachers, especially the dead ones. And they'll tr don't be surprised when they try that. Well, you know, these guys, they betray the real message of, and then they'll try to find some person who was kind of on the periphery. They ain't going to do that. They wouldn't dare try with Dr. Clark or with Joseph Ben, Dr. Ben. They, they can't do it with them, but they'll, they'll try to find some other person who bumped elbows with Dr. Clark. And yes, I am being deliberately oblique about this. I'm not coming up the middle. I expect you to be able to read between the lines. But they'll find some people who were a little bit soft on some of those issues or who weren't as hard about it as they should have been. And expect those guys to get brought out. White supremacy understands where the line is, and they understand how to stick a toe across it. You see, the black media is making the real content for black people. White media is trying to reverse engineer their own, and their bootlicks like roly-poly Martin have failed. Joy Reid is circling the toilet bowl. And the four stooges who CNN is going to put on the air, their show is already DOA. I'm just going to call it now. The only question is, will you buy their crap? Because to return to my knockoff analogy, a slick imitation is still just an imitation. White power managed to subvert the old black media 50 years ago. Some of the so-called black publishers, we need to be honest about who and what these guys were. They were looking to sell out. Others watered down the message because they wanted to fit into white society. A lot of them, they figured that because they were able to get themselves an upper middle class income from their publishing business, that this gave them entree to whiteness, that they were part of white society now. And well, they didn't want to offend their new pals by all talking all that black stuff. So it became all about celebrity gossip. And it became all about actors and singers, infotainment. These guys were basically the TMZ before TMZ was cool. These black publishers, they were taking their cues from the white media and they were taking their orders from the white corporations who bought advertisements and the rags that they published. So white media using their studios and their resources to prop up black flunkies to deceive us, it's not new at all. It is quite old. We let white power appropriate our music. We let white power appropriate our cuisine. We let white power appropriate our fashion. Fake black soul food restaurants owned by non-black people who in many cases hated hate us. Fake black cosmetics. Fake black clothing lines. White Latino and Asian singers who imitate rap, R&B, and jazz. 
Joss Stone couldn't carry a tune with a forklift, but who do you see the white media pushing? Same goes for Ed Sheeran, Sam Smith, the list goes on and on and on. And now we see the white media pushing hard to fabricate their own fake copy of the black media too. It was only a matter of time before they got around to this. This is a standard tactic of white supremacy. There have been some abortive efforts before by the white media to try to prop up some phony black media types, you know, like Goldie Taylor, but that fell flat. Agent DuVernay, she got no traction for her 13th Amendment documentary, but the miniseries that she did about the Central Park Five, that turned some heads. It was supposed to. There happen to be some white media types who understand that if they're going to build credibility for some of their agents and Agent DuVernay, I don't give a damn how many of you fell for her con game. She is an agent of white supremacy. They understand that they're going to have to go ahead and give a little bit of credibility, make it where her documentary is lauded. And, oh, Linda Fairstein, she's going to lose her publishing gig until she gets picked up by another publisher. White supremacy does not fire its operatives. It simply moves them around. They just get transferred. Sorry for those of you who thought that that was some sort of win. It wasn't. But what's going to happen is a lot of you are going to look and say, yeah, this is just like uh, when the white media did that O.J. Simpson thing. Yeah, except the difference is when the white media pulled their O.J. Simpson stunt, that was for the sake of laying the groundwork for more laws to come against us. Were the laws to go after prosecutorial misconduct? To go after malicious prosecutors? Were the laws, especially when it comes to race, to, pro to go after prosecutors who decided they were going to railroad black defendants? Were the laws about that? I'll wait. You know, there are lots of people who we should look to to carry the flag for our issues, but we should not allow white supremacy to trot out one of their hand-picked puppets to do it. Whatever value you may have thought came from that Central Park Five miniseries, in my eyes, it was completely and thoroughly nullified by the person who was used to do it. That's a reality, because if you go along with Agent DuVernay on this, well, the problem is you're going to have to go along with her on her next one, and I can promise you, before it's all over, she will reveal exactly where the hell she's been at. I told you about her before now. And she is going to return to that when she thinks she's got enough of you drinking the Kool-Aid. When she thinks she's got enough of you going, well, uh, maybe it's more complex than that. Uh, maybe there's more to it than that. Well, you know, I don't agree with this, so this over here, but, uh, maybe we can go with the, on some of this. That's what, that's what they're counting on, because unfortunately there are some black folks who can always be counted on to backslide, backtrack, and turn tail from their, on their principles. But after Agent DuVernay CNN announces their all-black panel sideshow, and the New York Slimes right after that announces their 1619 project, man, we're just getting one after the other after the other. We got just this full-on assault by the white media, a full court press, trying to attempt to appropriate the black media's place in the world. Because that's what's supposed to be the end game here. Hey, you don't need to listen to Jason Black. You don't need to go see Race War. You don't need to go and purchase any 7 a.m. documentaries or Gentrified or Hidden Colors or anything else. You can just wait for Agent DuVernay and Netflix to bring you something. Because after all, it's going to be shot with high. It's going to be shot with uh, red cameras or black magic, and it's going to have some name brand actors in there, people who you've seen on TV, and they're going to be having interviews on ABC, and, and you're going to have these people being nominated for awards at white awards ceremonies. So, you know, why should we be working ourselves and hurting ourselves? We'll just sit back and we'll let Agent DuVernay do the work. And of course, Agent DuVernay's thinking, I'm just trying to get black folks to go in the wrong direction, and now you'll be right back in the clutches of the same white media who you had just escaped from. It's amazing how many black people are being willfully blind. Didn't I just get through telling you about the Judas goat? Where were these clowns at the last 10 plus years? 
Before the black media, these chumps were nowhere to be seen. In fact, they were railing against everything that we've been championing they were attacking for the last decade or so on the few occasions when they bothered to mention it. This is nothing more than a clumsy attempt to preempt the black media, to try to make up their own material that's supposed to look and sound like it came from us, or at the very least sound and look like it's saying the same things we're saying. But they're not. These white power knockoffs may not be made from shoddy materials, they may have slick, expensive marketing and production values, but all they really amount to are big budget frauds. And you, you're going to think that you're helping other black people. And that's how the white media is going to sell it to you. Why? Don't you know that black people are going to be working because of these little frauds? I mean, on production that we're putting on, don't you? Black, this will employ black people. And it's going to help to get the message out. The message? Yeah, but they never tell you what whose message it is. Oh, it's going to get the message out. But the message is going to be that black people need to sit on their hands while white supremacy finishes the job of liquidating the former slaves. That's the message they're trying to get out. And that's the reason why I didn't like what the hell some of y'all going along with Agent DuVernay. That plays to the same fraud of, well, there was some bad stuff that happened in the past, but things are better now. Why? Uh, Linda Fairstein, she got punished. She didn't get punished. She got barely a slap on the wrist. She was, in, she was temporarily inconvenienced. But that's the narrative. Oh, a lot of bad stuff happened, but it's better now. It's certainly better now. These attempts by the white media to try to co-opt us and to try to subvert us and to try to replace and overthrow us and get black people to look the other way and to try to get distract black people from the message of the black media. This is not some victimless crime. It's not some small thing when you have this attempt by the white media to try to erase us, to try to come up with their own phony baloney substitutes for us. That's not some victimless crime. Famous Amos had his company taken right from under him. His claim to fame was that he made good cookies. He built brand equity into that, into his name. Then he got into bed with Kellogg's, who had other ideas. The end. By the way, he, Wally Amos tried to start another line of cookies, but that failed, totally failed. Famous Amos cookies are still successful. Some of you probably are eating them right now. What a shame Wally Amos is not successful and these days he's having a hard time eating. And how many black people still buy famous Amos cookies? How many black people tell their black children that it was a black man who started that company? And these black people, how many of them don't even know that a white company kicked him out of his own brand? They kicked him out of his own business and that they're keeping all the money. Letting white power appropriate our movements, it's not some victimless crime. It's racial warfare. What the white media is doing is racial propaganda, using black people to sell big white lies. Whatever we create, white power buys it, like FUBU and Carol's Daughter sold to L'Oreal. And the black woman who owned Carol's Daughter, she's been arrogant and belligerent about how that was such a smart move. All that she did was she took a quickie pay payout and the black community lost what could have been an economic anchor. And what a surprise, she ain't been able to, she has not tried or even bothered to attempt anything since. White power knows when they're dealing with a Negro who's eager in the pants to sell out. You got some Negro who cannot wait to sell out. White supremacy knows when they're dealing with someone like that. But these black entrepreneurs, most of them, they just want to retire early and lounge full time. Or if they don't necessarily want to run off to the beach right this moment, what they really want is to get into a higher tax bracket so that they can be on the cheese and croissant circuit. So that they can basically be on the white party up in the hills circuit full time. Our community is flat on its back economically because we do not have economic anchors. The people who are actually supposed to be establishing them, what they're really looking for is a quickie payout that they can use so that they can go run off to the beach. They all are looking for a quickie payday from white supremacy, and what they'll say is, well, I've earned this. Maybe they have, but the black community certainly deserves better. 
and what they'll some of them will say well i don't i got a million ideas i don't necessarily need the one that i sold why i've got a million ideas and i know i can make them work well all of these clowns they try some half-baked attempt at a second business venture but predictably these follow-up ventures they never perform like the first one did you see, to create or build something that endures for the long term, that is largely a matter of hard work, but it's also a matter of good luck, and you can't buy that. It never occurs to these fools that most businesses fail, and that includes the business ventures of people who are already successful with one venture. No matter how much money you put into something, it's more than likely, especially in the world of business, the odds are that it's going to fail. So if you've got a business venture that works, you have to stick with it. But that's not how a lot of these fools think, and white supremacy preys on that. Well, no need to prey on it. You got these fools eagerly offering up the crown jewels to their enemies and then saying that it's smart. They think that it's cute to do that. This is what we're up against, family. Now we can turn the tide. We can turn this thing around. But we got to be honest about what's going on. And you cannot be listening to any of the white media's reverse engineered frauds. You better make sure that you get all your news, views, and reviews from the new voices of black media. You already got a media. You don't need white supremacy trying to figure out how to create some knockoff. This is why I keep saying that it matters who you get your information from. It matters who you get your information from. Who is it telling you these things? Is it someone who has proven themselves to be true? Is it someone who speaks to your power? Is it someone who represents the streets? Or someone who represents some white media bankroll? Is it somebody who's been in the trenches with you? Or is it somebody who comes asking for black people's support when they got their butts in a crack? Is it somebody who's put in the work? Somebody who has warned you of the dangers of white supremacy long before it gets here? Or is it somebody who is shucking, jiving, and buck dancing with Hillary Clinton? We got to make sure that we are very, very discriminating when it comes to who we listen to. You can't just have any old Tom, Dick and Harry, Jane, Sue and Mary who comes along and says, well, just because I'm black, you should listen to me. No, it's got to be more than that. If the only thing you're bringing is a requisite amount of melanin, then you ain't brought enough. The entire point of the black media is it's not just black, it's black media. Not just some black talking head. And do not think that this is going to be the last time that I bring this up. White supremacy is not doing this little con game as some one and done effort. They're going to be digging in for the long haul. Because they understand that as long as our message is out there, they've got to have their lies out there. Now, we don't have the ability yet to punish them for putting out these lies. But we do have the ability to continue to push and promote the black truth. We're going to be here. You make sure that you're here too. Close your ears to any lies that the white media tries to bring you. Close your eyes to any of their deceptive images. Do not pay any attention to their liars and their con men and con women. We're too smart for that. We're too ambitious for that. Never ever forget that white supremacy created the white media. And they didn't create it in order to promote your interests. They created it in order to promote theirs. So if you see some person like an Agent DuVernay who does some miniseries that makes your heart go pitter-pat, just understand white supremacy believes in playing mental judo, mental taekwondo with you and using your own momentum against you. You think that you're being propelled in the position of black empowerment and they're actually getting ready to judo throw you right back into subjugation. That's how serious this is. Because some black folks, they get hoodwinked when they see white supremacy decide, okay, we're going to go ahead and say a little bit of this real stuff. Man, that's sprinkling sugar on crap. That's all they're doing. 
You better start considering the source. When it comes to anything that you get from any sort of media, the very first thing you're supposed to do, the very first thing you're supposed to do is to consider the source. Did it come from the new voices of black media? No. Then it probably is something that's supposed to kill you. You can't afford to get wobbly at a time like this. You can't afford to start flip-flopping and vacillating at a time like this. You better tattoo this on the underside of your eyelids if you need to. The situation is all the way real. The white media is spreading lies and they're expecting you to listen to it. You better wise up. The only voices that you can afford to listen to are the new voices of black media.